praise the Lord, everybody. This is the day that the Lord has made. Can you stand on your feet, clap your hands, and open up your mouth and begin to saturate this atmosphere this morning? Come on and bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that was in me, within me. Let's bless his name. Let's bless his name as a collective body. Come on, let's not focus on one another. Let's just go into the courts of heaven and let's bless the Lord in this room. Our assignment this morning, before we do anything, we start everything with prayer. And we are bearers of God's glory. We carry the weight of God's presence. And this morning, we're going to infuse the strength of God in this room. So can we just go to the throne room of grace as a collective body? For one can chase a thousand, but two puts 10,000 to flight. He says in his word, when we call him, he'll be there in the midst of us. So can you partner with us as we go to the throne room? Father, we thank you. We give your name praise. We give your name glory. We give your name honor for you're a good God and we choose to rejoice and be glad in you. Father, I thank you this morning that we can come into this place called True City to bless your name. Father, you're worthy of all the glory. Father, you're worthy of all the praise. We count it a joy and an honor and a privilege just to bless you. So Spirit of the living God, would you fall afresh in this room? This morning, God, you brought us to the midpoint of the year called June. And God, we thank you that this is going to be a month full of the miraculous, full of momentum, full of favor, full of victory. Father, we honor you and we release the truth of God's word in this room. Father, we thank you for your word says that you're a light. For your word says that you are the light of our salvation. Whom shall we be afraid of when the enemy comes in like a flood? The spirit of the living God lifted up a standard against him. So we thank you, God, that you are a standard lifting God. So this morning, God, we call you Abba because we know Father knows best. So we thank you that we're created in your image and in your likeness. Father, I thank you for in the book of Genesis, you blew breath into man. And Father, we thank you that you blow on every situation. So Spirit of the living God, breathe in this room. May the Shekinah glory and the Ruach and the Numa be in this atmosphere. Spirit of the living God, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Let it quicken your sons and daughters. This morning, God, you've given us the authority to legislate, to delegate, to authorize in the realm of the spirit. So Father, because we don't live down here, we live in the invisible realm. So we speak those things that are not as though it is until it becomes so. So Spirit of the living God, we ask you to make this place your dwelling place. Make this a habitation of heaven. I thank you, Father, for the angels that guard the gates of worship, for the angels that guard the gates of praise. Spirit of the living God, release Gabriel, the Michael, the one that speaks on our behalf, Michael that fights on our behalf, Jehovah Rapha, the God that healeth thee, Jehovah Gabor, the one that fights. May you war for us this morning. So Father, we thank you, for you're the God with us, you're the God in us, and you're the God for us. The word says, if God be for us, who can be against us? So Father, because we have no reason to fear, and because Galatians 6 and 9 says, be not weary, in well doing, you shall reap if you faint not. So God, I thank you, for this is our reaping season. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that you're the lifter of our head. For you said in the book of Psalms, lift up your head, all ye gates, be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? It's the Lord strong and mighty. It's the Lord mighty in battle. So we plow the ground and we shake this place. Let an eruption come in the room now. Father, I decree and declare, Spirit of the living God, may you show yourself strong and mighty. Father, I thank you this morning for the push of heaven. I thank you for the push of heaven. I thank you for the push of heaven. I thank you for assistance from on high. 
God, I thank you that the corridors are open to us. Kind sir, this is your dwelling place. We are your people and you are our God. You said in your word, when the righteous cry, you hear them and you deliver them out of all of their trouble. So we are the righteous and we cry this morning. Holy are you, Lord. Holy are you, Lord. Holy are you, Lord. Holy are you, Lord. Sovereign, majestic, righteous, Elohim, El Rohan, the God that answers by fire, the quickener, the one that was, is to come. So we bless your name. So we bless your name. So we bless your name. We lay aside every weight and we stand between the porch and the altar. So God, we turn this service over to you. We thank you for what you're going to do. We move out of your way. We say that this service is subject to change through the power of the Holy Ghost. And Father, while you're at it, we pray now for our pastors, Dr. Kalita Forbes and Pastor Chris. We thank you for giving us pastors after thy own hearts. So Spirit of the living God, we thank you for the blood of Jesus that surrounds them. You said, the steps of a good man are ordered by God. So we thank you that their steps are ordered. They're blessed in the city. They're blessed in the field. They're blessed when they come and they're blessed when they go. I thank you, God, that there is no demon, no witch, no warlock, no demonic incantation or white magic or sorcery that shall come against them. So, Father, we bless you. We honor you. We give you glory. We ask for you to hallow in this place. Hollow in this place, hollow in this place. We make your name large. We make your name large. We make your name large. For you're the God that answers by fire. And we bless you and give you glory. Hallelujah. Come on, just real quick. Take the next 30 seconds and just tell the Lord how amazing he is. We have the attention of heaven this morning. Uh, heaven has invaded this atmosphere. Uh, this atmosphere is full of angels this morning. Uh, I declare that the waters are troubled, yea, even now in the name of Jesus, yes. Uh, and then we have the attention of the master. Oh, yes. Come on, somebody shout out to God with a voice of triumph. Oh, my God. Uh, there's a wave getting ready to wash over this place. Somebody shout out to God with a voice of praise. If the Lord has done anything for you this week, open up your mouth and say thank you. If he kept you this week, open up your mouth and say thank you. Hey. If he sustained you this week, open up your mouth and say thank you. Hey. If he paid a bill for you this week, open up your mouth and say thank you. Oh my God, we lift your name. We lift your name, we lift your name, we lift your name. Oh my shepherd, and up my son, and up my heaven is in this room this morning. Hallelujah! Ebe shabra, Roman de lebe. Oh my God! Yeba mama said, "Be man, be 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 so." Roba shanda le de bahaye de baba so. Roba mama saya. Give me about ten more seconds. Yeba mama so. Roba de le de basa na na mama so. Come on, be 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 sia. Yeah, oh sia. Oh my God! Hey, we lift your name. We lift your name. We lift your name. We lift your name. Hey. We lift your name, we lift your name, hey, Shama. We lift your name, we lift your name, we lift your name. We lift your name, we lift your name, we lift your name, hey. We lift you, we lift you, we lift you, we lift you. We lift you, we lift you, we lift you, we lift you. Oh yeah. For the Bible tells us if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. Oh my God, so we're going to lift him up this morning. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, just begin to put those hands together for me all over the building. And if you know it, I need you to sing it out for us. I know I've got some tenors, altos, and sopranos hiding out out there. I need your help this morning. Come on.
If you know that the Lord is great, just tell to find somebody to your right or left and just say, He's great, He's great, He's great. Come on, put those hands together all over the building. Come on. Say, oh, 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 Listen, I know you know they say how great is our God, our God. Sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our.
something's getting ready to happen in here. You're great, 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 nobody like you, none in all the earth, you are the great God, great God, great, great, great God, somebody say you're great, say it again, say you're great, say it again, say you're great. 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 You're great. You're great. You're great. What my mama said, hey, baby, so what my mama said. Oh, God, what my mama said, what my mama said. Oh, 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 oh. Hey, hey, hey. Oh, what my mama said. So great, so great, so great. Oh, shot. Come on, great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. I said great is the Lord, and great. Somebody, I said great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. Does anybody have a praise to give him today? Has he done anything for you over here? Has he done? Hey, has he done? What about?
together. Uh, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Uh, enter into his courts with praise. Uh, be thankful unto him uh, and bless his name. You run when you've been 
rescued! Rescuers, run! I'm a runner because I've been rescued! Run, Duchenne! You about to run right into your destiny! Okay, praise him. Don't nobody move. Don't nobody get hurt. All right, y'all sit, sit. So I can welcome people. I want to welcome the saints. If y'all sit down, I can welcome them properly. Like we're sophisticated. Is somebody getting a flashback? Oh, a memory will mess you up. You don't know what he's done for me. I can't even tell you. If I told you my whole story, you wouldn't want to sit next to me. You would think that there's no way he can clean that up. Hey! But I'm here to let you know, Clorox ain't got nothing on the blood. Lysol ain't got nothing on the blood. He's washed me! Whiter than snow, yeah. Paul said I was the chief sinner. He said I wrote the book on sin. Hey! But I had a Damascus praise him, Darnell. It took the scales off my eyes. Hey. And because of that, I love him. I really do, I love him. All right, y'all gonna let me greet the visitors? I don't know who you are, woman of God. Have you been here before? Oh, listen to me. The Spirit of the Lord would say to you, He's well pleased with you. There is a joy that rests on the countenance of your face. And God says, I've given you an anointing to bring joy into every atmosphere that I send you to. He said, you don't worry about trial, you don't worry about test, but you have a joy anointing. And God says, think it not strange that you go into joyless atmospheres. That's because you've been sent there to let them know that the joy of the Lord is their strength. Welcome to True City. Can y'all sit down, please? I'm gonna do the thing. This, y'all sit.
Y'all sit, y'all sit. Come on, we're gonna move the service forward. You don't know, I'm trying to sing you into your seat. What he's done for me, he gave me the victory. You don't know what he's done. show on the road. Say, hey, something happens when you fall in love with him. We're not talking about religion right through here. We're talking about relationship. This is a private thing now. This is personal now. This is intimate now. All right. I love the Lord. I love him, I love him. All right, y'all said, I love him, I love him, I love him, I love him. I need you to sit in your seat. Sit, 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 sit. Some of y'all are still standing, sit. Sit in your history with God. Glory. And Spencer just now was up here singing in Spanish just now. And that's interesting because the Lord has shown me that a lot of the Latino community are going to be coming to True City in the future. And he up here singing in Spanish. <laughs> Y'all know that the Lord be using this little praise team. Gosh, God be using y'all. We're transitioning. You don't know. He had to do so many things for me. But in spite of myself, he gave me victory. I'm going to change it. So I'm going to serve him I'm gonna serve him I'm gonna serve I'm gonna serve I'm gonna serve the Lord listen welcome to true city where we are transforming lives through the truth of God's word. I am so grateful. Hallelujah. Can I get my iPad to see all of you? And you know I can talk on top of praise. I can talk on top of tears. 
you, this is your church. Be free in here. Because nobody knows like you know. They truly couldn't handle it. But we want to welcome you to a place that we believe is very special. And I want to let you know that this day has been crafted with you in mind. So we want to welcome you to True City. Listen, do I have any people, this is your first time in the building. You don't have to bust a move. We're not gonna jump on you. We literally just want you to just wave your hand because we want to count our blessings. If this is your first time ever being in the building, can you wave your hand? God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. God bless you, God bless you. True City, God bless you. We are so grateful to have you in the building with us on today. Listen, on behalf of myself and Pastor Chris, Pastor Chris, wave your hand just in case they don't know where you are, and all of the partners of True City, again, we want to welcome you. We believe that our worship experience today is going to be the better because you're a part of it. And so there are so many amazing churches that you could have come to today. And so we want to let you know how much we honor your presence and we're grateful for the opportunity to meet you first by the spirit amen and then hopefully we'll get an opportunity I will to meet you naturally for a couple of moments after church but we want to welcome you to true city and true city I need you to do me a favor I'll deal with some other stuff later but listen my b-r-o-t-h-e-r my brother is present with me today. He surprised me and snuck up on me. And when he walked in my office, I thought I was going to pass out because he lives on the West Coast. Um, can you stand on your feet? Because we do honor here at True City. And I want to honor my brother, Pastor Adrian Davis. Just wave at the people of God. That's my brother. And he done tricked me on today. And so I'm so grateful you can have your seat to have him. There's another strikingly handsome debonair gentleman, but we'll deal with him later. Glory to God. You know what I do want to do right now? Birthdays. Who was born? Deandra said, ow. Deandra, you're a June baby. Come on. Angela is a June baby. Nellie is a June baby. Look at all these June babies. June, are you June as well? June 9th. Happy birthday to every single one of you that God is blessing you to see another year of life. The reason why you're still alive is because God's not done yet. And so that means you're staring in the face of purpose. And so we want to honor all that God is about to do in your life in this next year. And we just want to say on behalf of your True City family, happy birthday. Okay, family, so listen, let's get down to the get down. You know what we're going to do. We're going to stand up on our feet. We're going to love up on one another in a way that makes people feel comfortable. If you want to, you can take a selfie of us. If you do, go ahead ahead and remember to post it on your Instagram stories and don't forget to tag us so that the team can repost it but we're going to stand on our feet and we're going to transition so that we can hear what God has to say and then all of the children you can be dismissed at this time uh Tanisha I mean, yep she's sitting right over there ready to receive they're like uh-huh we're out of here all right baby so you can move so come on family let's love upon one another as we get prepared to hear from God. God. It loosens and breaks every fetter. So my faith is increased. New blessings are released because of my praise. It loosens and breaks every fetter. My faith is increased. New blessings released. It's my praise. My praise causes things to better. Come on, my praise. 
feel like it's already looking better for you, yes? I don't believe y'all. Yes? Okay. Yes. Glory to God. Okay, family, listen. We are going to be doing something a little unique today, but for those that have been connected to True City, you know that we've done this on a couple of occasions, um, and we're just excited about all of the different ways um, that God wants to speak and minister to us. So there's somebody here today who is one of the greatest human beings that I know personally. <clears throat> he is one of my closest friends. He's a brother. He's a confidant. I trust him. He's a man of God who's been in ministry for many years, many years. If you've been connected to True City, he's not a stranger to you. You guys affectionately call him Uncle Jared. And I always remember that when we had our very first pre-launch service, I was so nervous, y'all. I didn't know if anybody was going to show up. We were on Georgia Avenue at the incubator. And we were, I was up and I was teaching and I saw this handsome, light-skinned, tall man walk past the mirror. And while I'm teaching, I said, gosh, that gentleman looks just like Jared. It was him. He flew into town for the genesis of this work to support Chris and I. And there's not one important moment of this faith community that he has not flown into town to be present for. More than that, he's full of the Holy Ghost and knows the book from Genesis to Revelation. I'm going to share with you the reason why he's here in a minute. But I do need you to stand on your feet as we welcome who it is that God is going to use today in a very special way. This is my brother, Reverend Jared Brown. And I want you to welcome, to welcome him. Looking very, doesn't he look wonderful? I said that suit is suiting. Well, I knew where I was coming. He DC knew. in the house, right? Okay. 
All right, so family, you can have your seat. Have your seat in the presence of the Lord. Uh, you need some more space, you good? Okay. You want me to move this floral arrangement? I appreciate it. There the was a flower, ain't it cute? <laughs> All right, family, so I'm going to just listen. We're family. All right. So this is what we have going on today. You guys know that we have been in a series called Father Knows Best, right? And so we're going to do something today which I'm calling Couch Conversations. And so that's what we're calling today. And we've been in this series called Father Knows Best and since the top of May, for those that may not be aware, We've been dealing from the foundational scripture about the spirit of adoption. Remember, for those that may not know, and True City knows that this is the year of the faithful and that we're believing God to fill us supernaturally with divine faith. That we know that a lot of us have a measure of faith, but as the scripture says, I believe, but God help my unbelief. And so remember, as God has been speaking regarding what he wanted to share with us this entire year to build our faith, he was intentional for these two months to dig in and expose and do ministry around what impacts our ability to have faith in God. And one of those hindrances is actually trusting him. And the reason why sometimes it's hard to trust him is because we could have father fractures, things that we've experienced in our lives that really prevents us from seeing him as a loving father. So it's hard to believe that he knows what's best for us. So with the concept of the spirit of adoption, I wanted to bring the scriptures alive for you today. Reverend Jared is here today because he is a walking epistle read of men and that when it comes to the spirit of adoption, both naturally and spiritually, he has lived this. And so you are about to see the Bible come alive right before you. I want you to give him honor in your heart because this is a story that he has never in his life shared publicly. We are the first partakers of his own healing. So this is a holy moment, and I want our faith community to reverence it as such. And so, Reverend Jared. God bless you. Good morning. Well, afternoon now, True City. <laughs> I've been saying for years, that I am a pseudo member of True City. I love this church and I'm so grateful to be here and honored to be here. And I'm just so glad to see all these familiar faces, not just because I know you, but because I see you still maintaining and holding on in the faith. And not just that, I see you growing in God. And it is a blessing. I'm grateful and God be praised for the work that's being done here. I would be remiss if I didn't stop right now and give honor to the angels of this house, my dear brother, Pastor Christopher and Dr. Kalita Forbes. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. In True City, I wanted to make sure that you understood that you can always tell what God thinks about you and what it is that you're called to do and called to be in him based on the type of leaders that he gives you. Well, what do I mean? You know, if you, with all due respect, if you're not really called and expected to have a lot of weight and make noise in the realm of the spirit, well, your leaders, they'll be rather pusillanimous and kind of passive and just going along. But when you're called to do, as the Bible says, great exploits, he'll give you leaders that know how to properly prognosticate and divide the word of truth. He'll give you leaders that have vision, that have prophets, and can then shoot you to your next level. I'm talking about your pastors. Come on here, True City, and give God praise for what he thinks about you. Oh, bless his name. I give the Lord honor. So I'm here from Atlanta. We're going to be didactic and pedagogical. We're going to be buttoned up. <laughs> Vocabulary! We thank God. And so as we were preparing to come, Father Knows Best 
and the spirit of adoption. Let's go to the word. The book of Jeremiah, chapter 1. Jeremiah, chapter 1, beginning at verse number 4 through 8. In the King James Version, the, you stand. All right, I'm going to honor the call of the house. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctify thee, and I ordain thee a prophet to the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shall speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. So far the text. You can have your seat, but on your way down, tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, God has a plan with you in mind. Come on, say it like you got the Holy Ghost. Say, neighbor, oh, neighbor, God has a plan with you in mind. And I'm here to tell you it's a plan of the Lord. It's going to redeem us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Don't y'all push me now. <laughs> Hallelujah. I feel God's presence in the place. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And so, as it goes, I received context of some background from my parents. And as the story goes, in the early 70s, there was a young woman who was dating a man and she was in love with this man. They dated for about two or three years. And she was the daughter of a prominent pre preacher in the Carolinas. And she was the youngest daughter of this preacher, and she lived still with her parents. So she was dating this gentleman. They tell me he was a tall, charismatic, handsome. And that's what they said. Yeah, they said. And so they went on. And so she called him one day, and she said, hey, I need to tell you something. I'm pregnant. So you have to marry me. And he said, well, Houston, we have a problem. I can't marry you. She said, why can't you marry me? He said, well, because I'm already married and I have a family. He lived across town. Now you gotta remember this is in the 70s, this is before social media, before cell phones. So living across town was almost like a whole nother world. So she said, oh my God, he said, I'm sorry. Never talked to her again. So she began to think, what am I going to do because I cannot bring a reproach on my family. I can't be seen as a fornicating, adulterous woman. This is a married man. So what am I going to do? She called her sister. Her older sister lived in Pennsylvania. She called her sister. She said, let me tell you what's going on. She tells her the story. And her sister said, what are you going to do? She said, I don't know. She said, maybe y'all know the road. Her sister said, no, don't do that. How many know that God has a plan with you in mind? Her sister said, I'm telling you what you do. You come to Pennsylvania, finish out your pregnancy here, have the baby, and put the baby up for adoption. You go back home, nobody will ever have to know. Her sister gave her a plan. She got on the plane or the bus or the car. She went to Pennsylvania. She had a baby boy on February the 5th. And on February the 7th, she signed the adoption papers and that baby boy became a ward, if you will, of the state of Pennsylvania. We now call it foster care. And so for 11 months, this baby boy was in the system as a foster child. But God has a plan all along. And so there was another couple in Pennsylvania across town by the name of Claude and Wanda Brown. And this couple, they had already had some children of their own, but Wanda began to have complications, some medical complications, and it was determined that she could no longer have children. She always had the dream of having a large family. So she and her husband began to have conversations. She said, well, maybe we should adopt. He agreed, so they began to go through the process of adoption. So they identified an adoption agency and went and you know, decided we're gonna adopt it. But they said to themselves, we really want a baby girl right now. They called the adoption agency up and they said, well, you know, come on in. Unfortunately, we don't have any baby girls, but we do have a little boy that we want you to meet. 
And he said, well, no, you know, we appreciate it. But no, we, we really don't you know, want a boy right now. We wanted a girl. They said, yeah, I understand. But would you just meet him? So they come into the room, and they see this baby boy standing up in the crib. And they said, oh, he's a little cute little baby. Hi, how you doing? But we said we want a little girl. So they're leaving out of the room. And my mother tells me to this day, she said, Jared, when I was leaving the room, she said, something in me said, turn around. And when she turned around, she said, I looked at you in your eyes, and your eyes spoke to my spirit and said, don't leave me here. She heard the spirit of God. They decided to adopt me. I am the little boy. They adopted me and changed my name. They named me. Jared. Jared is a biblical name. He is in the book of Genesis. Jared was the great-grandfather or the grandfather of Methuselah, which was the great-grandfather of Noah. You can look it up. So I'm all in the book. <laughs> and so they adopted me, and I began to go through the process of growing up. And as I'm growing up, all right, yeah, that's me. Look at God. And so as I'm, I'm going through the process of growing up, starting school, and I have my brother and my sister, and this is my family. And my mother had already gotten saved, and she was in the church. And so as she was in the church, she would bring me to church with her. And I'm loving God, I'm loving family, I'm loving life, living a happy child's life. And so I was about four years old. My dad, he wasn't saved, he was a doozy, and he decided... You know what? I don't know what hit his mind. Nothing but the devil. He said, I don't want to do none of this anymore. I don't want to be married. I don't want any children. I'm leaving. Tells my mother I'm leaving. And she said, well, where are you going? He was coming to Washington, D.C. <laughs> he said, take me to the bus station. I want to go. I'm leaving. And so my mother says, all right. She got me in the car. We're driving my dad to the bus station. And my father tells me, he said, Jared, I was walking to the bus and you were holding my hand. And he says, I was approaching the bus. You pulled my hand and you said, Dad, go to church with me. He said, I said, oh, no, I'm going to D.C. I'm out of here. She, he said, once again, you stopped walking. You pulled my hand. You looked up at me and you said, Daddy, please go to church with me. Four years old, go to church with me. Something in his spirit said yes. He decided to go to church that night. He said when he got to the church, the preacher was preaching, and the title of his sermon was, A Place Called Hell. The man of God was preaching. That night, my dad went down to the altar, gave his life to the Lord. God, on the spot, saved him, healed him, filled him, and called him. And to this day, he's alive and well as an elder in the Lord's church. Come on, put your hands together. God's got a plan with you in mind. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I tell my dad all the time, I said, you can't never backslide. I said, because you're my credit in heaven. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I was just home last week, and I checked him out and said, you, you yet holding on, yeah? <laughs> and so God be praised for that. And so as time is still going on, I'm growing up, first, second, third grade. You know, back in those days when you would go outside and play, you know, it wasn't old video games. and You weren't in and out the house. When you were out, you were out all day long. You want a drink, go get you something from the hose. That's how we lived through COVID. I was drinking from a hose. COVID, come with something better than that. <laughs> so, you know, we're outside playing, and my mother tells me that, yes, my dad had gotten saved, but things weren't perfect. And so she and he were still going through their various marital issues. Of course, unbeknownst to me, I'm a child. I'm just enjoying life. But the spirit of depression had consumed her. And told her that the best thing for you to do at this point is to end your life. Because you can't take the pressure and the pain, the rejection and the disappointment, whatever was going on. And so she decided, that's exactly what I'm going to do. She said she was sitting in a room, and she had closed the blinds, it was dark. And she had put all these pills in her lap. And she decided she was going to take the pills and she was going to end it all. She said, Jared, out of nowhere. She said, you came in the room. You bust the door open. She said, this light came in the room with you. She said, you stood in front of me and said, Mommy, what are you doing? And she decided not to take the pills. And I'm here to tell you, as with my father, she's alive and well today and a missionary in the Lord's church. Come on, put your hands together. He's got a plan, 
And he's always had a plan with you in mind. And so, yeah, of course, I found this out later on in life. Again, I'm still just living and enjoying my life. But what I didn't know, at the age of 12 years old, my life was going to take a turn and literally turn it upside down. Because at 12 years old, I was told and I found out that I was adopted. And I can remember the day that I got the news like it was yesterday. I knew what I was wearing. I can see what my mother and father told me. And in that very moment, everything that I thought I knew and understood went out the window. The bottom literally dropped out because now I'm looking like, well, who are these people? Who do I look like? Who do I talk like? Where do I get this from? Where's my mindset from? Well, how, why? The spirit of the enemy in that moment spoke to me and said, if your own mother didn't want you, nobody's ever going to want you. And at 12 years old, I spoke back to that spirit and I said, I'll never let anybody hurt me again. And in that moment, I began to build walls and barriers around my body, my spirit, and my very heart to not let anybody in because I said, I'll never let anybody hurt me. And as the years went on, I'm still connected. I'm still in the church. We are a church family. So you go on a revival and you hallelujah. But I'm building in this root of bitterness is taking hold to my heart. And as I'm growing up, I had issues in my mind against my biological parents. Why would you give me away? What did I do? Why wasn't I good enough? Why didn't you want me? These are the questions I would ask myself with no one there and no one answering. And I also began to develop dissentment against my adoptive parents. They were just trying to help. And I would look for any opportunity or seemingly opportunity of indifference to say, see, they got their picks and chooses. They love their children more than they love me. They're biological, they're blood children. You see the work and the, the, the craftiness and the shadiness of the enemy? And so this bitterness is getting stronger and stronger. But again, I'm still in the church. I'm going on with Jesus. I'm loving God. I'm at revival, hallelujah. And about 15 years old, once again, my life takes another turn. And at this point, my, bio, my, my adopted parents, Claude and Wanda, seemingly had to take a step back so that my spiritual parents can take the forefront. Just like Jesus in the book of Matthew and Luke, when he was 12 years old, Mary and, Ma, Mary and Joseph, they were looking for him. They said, well, three days ago, where is Jesus at? They went back and they found him in the temple talking to doctors. They said, what are you doing here? He said, don't you know, it's time I be about my father's business. So at 15 years old, God is now shifting my life because now you got to get ready for the rest of your life. And we thank God for your adoptive parents, but now I got to begin to impart into you what you need to live until the end of your life. And so my spiritual parents, at the time, my pastor, Bishop Jesse T. Stacks, and his wife, Mother Gertrude Stacks, they were young, and I began to be with them. And they began to... Let's put their picture up, if yeah. you have that, Darnell. Yes. Yeah. And they were, they were this age when I met them, and <laughs> um, they be I, I began to be with them and was imparted into and taught and trained not only spiritual things, but natural things that my adoptive parents didn't have the capacity to teach. Simple things. I learned about the business of the church. I learned how to entreat people. I learned substance and character. I learned how to love men and women of God in the purest way. Learn how to study the scriptures. Learn how to get in God's face and to get God right while still living with my family. And so about 17 or 18 years old, I received a promotion and became Bishop Stax's one of his full-time armor bearers, and I began to travel with him. Now, that was another level because now I got to begin to teach you ministry. 
I got to teach you how to go to churches, how to sit in pulpits. You don't just sit up in the pulpit. You don't just walk up on pastors. Hey, what's up, man? There is a standard to holiness. There's a standard in God's house. That's why in the Old Testament, he had the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt and thou shalt not. God has a standard. You would learn how to be in the offices and see and hear what was going on and not walk out and run your mouth. You will learn discretion in the spirit. You learn how to cover the men and women of God and the saints of God. We family. This is your family. So we're going on. And I also learned from him. I would see him preaching in the pulpit. And then he's living his message in the car, living his message at home. So there was no difference. I didn't see a double life. So it taught me you can be consecrated. You can be saved and clean. Do you have his picture? They follow. It should be right there. Um, this time on the cover, I want to see. Um, which one is that? Um, number nine. Number nine with the red tag. Okay. And this is, he was a powerful man of God. He was a theologian of the scriptures, very, very sound in the word. He was a learned man, earning his doctorate in divinity. And before he got saved, he wanted to be an attorney. He said, Jared, I want to be a lawyer. I knew how to argue. <laughs> but God changed his mind and changed his plan. And, I, you know, he would, we had different versions of the Bible. I said, I didn't even know about these versions. He said, oh, you have to rightly divide. Different words and different versions will bring things to life for you. He taught us from Genesis to Revelations, not just to carry your Bible, but to have it on the inside of you and then to be living it. David said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. And again, time is going on. At this point, I'm riding. I'm enjoying it. I said, God, you, I felt almost like when Peter said, we can just stay here. I'm good with this. You know, I got Bishop, he's teaching us. We got mother, everything, everything is wonderful. But how many know? I told you, God always has a plan. And so I was about 24. I was traveling with Bishop. I feel like I was growing in God. What I didn't know is he had gotten sick. And we were, my last time seeing him, we were in Sacramento, California at a revival. And I was gathering every, everything. We were ready to go to the car. And he's just real random because he was always teaching. He said, Jared, he said, do you not know you can have a sickness? And you, as long as you stay stress-free, eat right, and take care of your body, you can live with a sickness for many years. I looked at him. Okay. God be praised. I didn't know what he was talking about. We got back home. And that was my last time seeing him. That was in June because in October of 2001, he passed away. And the night that they called me to tell me that he died, once again, it took me back to when I was 12 years old. The bottom dropped out. I, took, I got the news and I ran out of the house. I was hollering, oh God. I fell out, <laughs> just drama, fell out <laughs> in the middle of the street. And I was yelling out, God, what are we gonna do? God, I don't have anybody. Lord, what am I gonna do now? And in all of my pain and through all of that grief, and all of my crying and hollering, the Spirit of God came through all of that. And he spoke to me. He said, what do you mean, what are you going to do? Get up from here. He was just a man that I used for a time. He spoke Psalms 42, 15 in my spirit. Put that up for me. He said, why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? For I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. He said, get up from here. I'm the one who's died for you. I'm the one who called you, not him. And let me tell you something. You can love your pastors. You can honor your pastors. You're supposed to honor them according to the scriptures. You're supposed to respect them. But don't you ever put anybody before God. He is a jealous God. He wants to be head of our lives. And so as much as I heard the Lord in that moment, we went through all of the funeral services and it was, you know, the who's, who's, and the who's, what's. Everybody came. Tell them how you clowned at the funeral. Oh, yeah. Everybody came. You know, 
The Winans, the whole Winans family was from the church. Donna McClurkin, Prophetess Juanita Bynum, all of them come from that ministry. Bishop Stax was our spiritual father. So, I mean, you know, it was laid out. And so they had me on the ticket. To, we're going to have you to be one of the casket bearers. I was like, I can't do it. <laughs> come down. <laughs> you know, you're supposed to be spiritually mature. You know, I come down. I had my black on. We were supposed to wear another color. I said, I don't care. I wear black. I'm bored. I had sunglasses on. It was Gucci. Come down there. <laughs> they said, they looked at me. And Mother Sachs, she said, what is wrong with Jared? I said, what is wrong with her? I was so upset. But just carnal. I didn't understand. I thought I was further. And so... <laughs> I did. I thought I was, I mean, you could tell me I didn't have little baby wings on my back at the time. But God allows these things to happen to show you where you really are. And so they get down there and they close the casket. Oh, God. You, I wanted to jump in the hole. They looked at me, take him, put him in the car. <laughs> and so as much as I heard God, as much as I thought I knew him and loved him, after the funeral was over, I left the church. I left God. I left everything. And for seven years, I was in a backslidden state. I went down many roads, met many people. But how many know that the grace of God is sufficient? Oh, hallelujah. The hand of God in my sin was on my life. And because doctrine was put in me. Gee, but so far you can go when doctrine got a hold to you. Oh, bless his name. So even when you want to do some things, doctrine will speak and tell you, no, sir. Even in your sin. Because, see, doctrine is not a do or a don't. Doctrine is your protection. Hey. Oh, bless his name. So I was going down these roads, and out of nowhere, I would hear an old sermon. I said, I know you kidding me. I'm trying to go to the party. <laughs> I, remember, I remember, oh, you was rolling underneath the benches. You can't go to the tarot card reader and get a word. You can't go to, you know, you know what's, what's my numbers? Tell me, you know, what, 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 uh-uh. Doctrine was speaking out of me. You ain't going to the grave site talking to the dead. That's necromancing. Doctrine was in me, and it held me in position. That's what it does. Doctrine holds you in position until the Holy Ghost takes over. Because that is our leader and our God that will take us out of here. And so I come to the end of that time. This is about 2006, 2006, beginning of 2007. I was, I, God was gracious, and he had blessed me in my career at the time, and I had promoted, and I moved to Atlanta. And while I was in Atlanta, I uh, was growing in my job. You know, I was, hey, still doing my thing, though. And I looked back, and I said, you know, Father, I had left you, and I left the church and left your work but you still blessed me. Let me say this to you as well. I strongly believe and know that the reason why God still blessed me is because I had served his people and served his house with a pure heart. Let me tell you, credit with God is much better than your credit score. You want to have credit in the realm of the spirit. You got to come here and sweep floors. You got to, hey, let me open the door for you, please. Can I just drive the car? Find you something to do in God's house so that when the storms and the winds and the rain come, you got something to pull on. Father, remember how I served. Remember how I prayed. Lord, please remember me. And I live and I lived on the grace of God and the favor of God because how I had blessed his people. I didn't have a problem with 3 o'clock in the morning. You going to take food over to the saints in the middle of the night because they want to have a shut-in all night long. And I feel, I'm tired. I got to get my beauty rest. Oh, no, who? Go and get Pastor so-and-so from the airport. Yes, sir, my pleasure. You ain't showing up any old kind of way. Your shirt was starched, your clothes was ready, your car was clean, air conditioning set, heat set, whatever. Is there anything you need, man of God, woman of God? Because I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it unto him. Because he's going to pay me for this. Come to the end of that. I was, like I said, living in Atlanta. And out of nowhere, I begin, like I said, begin to hear sermons. I'm in the club. I'm at the party. I'm on, my, I'm on the plane going to a function. Oh, Jesus. I said, not today. Not today. <laughs> Hallelujah. Coming up in your spirit. You walking up on people. Hey, what's up? How you doing? God bless. I, yeah, yeah, what's up? You just church. You can't help it. It's in your DNA. 
I said, I'm, I'm blowing it. Oh my God, I'm like, a, I'm like a square trying to fit in this circle. Get up off of me. But God got a hook in you, and he won't let you go. Hallelujah. And so I'm going on. In 2000 and the end of 2007, beginning of 2008, I decided, you know what? I'm going back to God. He had tormented me long enough. I said, I'm going back. And Mother Stack, she was having a refreshing revival in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And I was in, at the time, I was in uh, Phoenix, Arizona at the Super Bowl. Now, so let me tell you this. I told God, I said, now listen, if I'm going to be in sin, I'm going to be VIP in sin. I ain't going to have to do nothing. If I'm going to be in God, I want every gift and every piece of anointing you got for me. But while I was in sin, I was with the who's who's and the who's what's. Okay? Now, I ain't saying it braggadocious. I'm trying to help you understand that when you are there, the enemy, he also has a plan. And his plan is to take you so far away that you can't get back. So anything you want, and when I'm in these various companies, anything you want, it's right there. It's available to you. And even when I came, into the, came back into the church, he said, you better know the difference between somebody that's doing things because they've been purged and somebody that's doing it out of a mere gift and popularity. I don't want to get off when I go down that road. So go to this service in Pennsylvania, and I walked in the church. Lights were so bright. Everybody hollering, Jesus, oh, Jesus, tell him yes. I said, oh, my God, what am I doing here? Every spirit of the enemy in me said, get out of here. What are you, what do you got us here for? I said, I don't know myself. <laughs> but now I got a ride there with my mother. So I couldn't leave. Uber went out yet. So I'm like, oh, man, I'm stuck. <laughs> so when I look back at the video of that particular service, it was so funny because literally if you have all these people, everybody in the church had gone up for prayer except for me. I was way back in the corner. My kneecaps were shaking. I said, oh, my God, I don't get out of here. And at the end, everybody's going up. Even the little babies, like the little baby came down and shouted. I said, oh, God, the little children is going up. I can't not go up in the prayer line. Like, oh, my God. Because I was afraid of what the Spirit of God would say to me. Because the gift that I was walking up on wasn't no shaman gift. Mother Sachs's range in the realm of the Spirit was very far. And I'd seen how her gift worked. And I said, no, man, now hold up. They got these cameras and she on the microphone. Tell you I said, no, God, you're going to tell everything I done did. But God is wise. And the spirit of the Lord is wise. And as you get trained in your gift, you get wise in the realm of the spirit. And so I walked up on her. And I told you, my, literally, literally, my kneecaps were shaking. Thank God I had, you know, suit on with some loose pants. I was like, oh, my goodness. And the Spirit of God didn't say anything that I thought he was going to say. The love of God came and found me. He came and found me in a pit, talked to where I was, brought me out and shot me to my next place. Oh, bless his name. And I, became re I was reclaimed at that moment. And now I can see things differently. But I'm in Harrisburg. I'm living in Atlanta. I can see things differently. I'm telling tell myself, okay, now I got to go back home. Now the real test works. Now it's really your testing time. So I said, all right, I'm going back home. I said, Father, you got to go before me. You got to help me because I was a leader in what I was doing. If we go into a function, I got the hookups. I got the connections. So everybody would come to me. Yo, Jay, you know, what's the plan? When we go in here, I know the owner. I know this person we in. We're going to park around the side. They're going to bring us through. We got security. Now they was dumb because they didn't get their own connections. You know, at least get your own hookups. <laughs> just riding, you know? And so I come back home because of the grace of God. He covered me and he hid me just like he did Paul. He hid Paul for those three years and sent him to Ananias' house when he had his Damascus Road experience. And I was back home in Atlanta. They wouldn't call me. They wouldn't look for me. And then out of nowhere, hey, Jay, where you at? What you, what you doing? What's up, man? I was like, oh, God, what am I going to do? How am I going to respond? God gave me what to do and how to do it. And then he removed the people literally from my life. I still live in Atlanta. Do you not know every single person that I ran with? That was in 2008. I have never seen them again. And they're alive and well. It blows my mind to the point sometimes I'm like, Lord, are you sure they're alive? 
I see it in social media. They're alive. But he's covered me and seared that connection instantly. And he spoke the scripture to me. Uh, which one is it? It is uh, 2 Corinthians 1.15. Put that up for me. And in this confidence, I was minded to come unto you before that ye might have a second benefit. And so now you're living on this second benefit that I've given to you. And so now I'm, he's, I'm going to hook you up with a mother that's going to teach you and train you all over again to what my spirit is doing now. Because, see, you know me from the 90s and early 2000s. But the spirit of God is always moving. He said, you don't know the 2008 realm of the spirit. So I got to teach you what you missed while you was clowning. And so put up picture number, um, what number is it here? Got my notes for y'all. Uh, picture 11. I would sit with mother. And she had to teach and train my spirit to where I was. Call me out. Show you different things. I'm trying to keep up with her. She in revival, and she was on the speed. She was moving. When you come, you just, your spirit is still dull. You look like, oh, man, we, we all night long? Yes, pow. You thought she was getting the charge. It was to get you to try to help out. <laughs> she was a teacher, and she was definitely a mother. And so when I was going through this time, I said, Father, I have a question for you. How and why did I backslide? Because I don't understand. I said, I was serving the man of God. I was in church. I was in revival. I was loving you. I said, how and why did I backslide? Kyron, the spirit of the Lord said to me, he said, you backslid because you never knew me. He said, you didn't know me. He said, every time he prayed, he was talking about Bishop, he said, every time he prayed, you prayed. When he consecrated, you consecrated. When he fasted, you fasted. He said, so when he died, he took your salvation right out of here with him. He said, you didn't know me. Philippians 3 and 10 says, oh, that I may know him. Yes, Hallelujah. In the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his suffering. Yeah. See, we want the power. We want to shake, rattle, and roll. We want to quicken and say yes and all that. We want to do these great things. But you got to suffer. You got to go through some things. He said, you got to get to know me. And that is why he moved me away from everything that I was familiar with. I don't want you around your family. I don't want you around the ministry. I want you to be in Atlanta alone. I didn't have a church or anything at the time. He said, and for this period of time, you and I are going to get to know each other. He said, now, he began to take me down through the corridors of my life and to introduce me and take me back to things that had happened. He said, you remember this? You remember this person? I said, yes, Lord. How do you feel about it? I said, oh, God, I'm so sorry things that I had done to people down through the years. See, when you begin to seek God and you seek him right, it's not to send you to the nations. It's not to give you some great anointing. Your first seek is to get you right. He got to take you back to all the mess we've done. You got to repent for those things. And when you laying out, oh, I'm laying prostrate. Hallelujah, prostrate on the ground. I got a great word. He gave you a word for you. That was for you, not for the church. You got to go some before he sends you to somebody. And so he's taking me down, and I said, oh, God, I'm so sorry. I was reading in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 6. It says, these are the six things that God hates. And he got to a proud look. And I said in my private, I said, Lord, what is a proud look? It was almost like the Holy Ghost said, oh, you want to know? I'm going to teach you what a proud look is. So in Atlanta, we have Ikea. You all heard about Ikea. And then our store in Atlanta, when you come from the parking lot, it's like this black glass, like mirrored glass. So I was leaving church one day, and I said, I'm going to stop by. I had never been to Ikea before at the time. It was a new, new store in the city. I said, I'm going to go to this Ikea. I hear everybody talking about it. And so I'm walking out of the car across the parking lot, and I see this glass, and I happen to look over. And when I looked over, I saw my reflection. And in that moment, the Spirit of God stopped time. Everything that was moving, literally like a movie, stopped the only thing that I could see was myself. And he said, you want to know what a proud look is? He went from the crown of my head to the very sole of my feet. He said, when you do this with your face, when you do this with your nose, and you talk over your nose at people, he said, with the tone that you use, the inflection that you use, your body language, he said, it's pride in your flesh, and I hate it. 
at Ikea, I began to cry. Never did go on this tour. I ran back to my car. I was so embarrassed because I had offended God. I said, I don't want God to hate nothing about me. I said, Father, please get this mess out of me. Deliver me, Jesus. Heal my heart. Heal my mind. Going down through the corridors of your life. So now we're coming up on, you want to go into ministry. You think you're ready? I said, yes, Lord, I'm ready. He said, you're not ready yet. Because the main chief that you forgot about, he searches the reins of our hearts. So he got to my heart. He said, how do you feel about your parents? I said, what now? Hold up. Because, see, I had locked that away. It was out of sight, out of mind. Nobody knew about that. Nobody knew how I felt about that. My own parents didn't know how I felt. I learned how to go along and say, hey, you know, I love you. Yes, mom. Yes, dad. They didn't know that I was bitter toward them for things that had happened, even in my adopted life. But the Spirit of God said, if I'm going to use you, I want to make sure I'm using you right. So I got to clean up every area. So he unlocked that door. It was a painful door. I thank God for my sister because it was 2019. We were in South Africa together. I've been blessed to see Pastor Chris and Dr. Kalita in literally almost every capacity that they can be seen in. I've seen them as husband and wife. I've seen them as son and daughter to their parents. I've seen them as brother and sister, as friend. We have traveled literally the world. You know, people say that they done been to, like, Mexico. Ain't nothing wrong with going to Mexico. I just came from Mexico. I love Mexico. But, you know, oh, we travel the world. We're international ministry. Okay, well, technically, but, you know, <laughs> let's be honest. <laughs> but we have traveled literally the world together. The reason I wanted to say that is you all are blessed because every place that we've gone, they have been the same. They have represented your church they have represented their God, and they've represented the kingdom well. And that is why you trust gifts, not just because you're friends, because I can be your friend. I have a lot of friends that are in ministry. You can't even pray over my food. I trust nothing about you, okay? And love you. You're my brother. You're my sister. Oh, I'm preaching that so. Oh, God. You coming? Absolutely not. Because, see, your attendance is agreement. If you go to every house, if you follow everybody, you better make sure I can support you. I'm going to send a prayer for you. What you doing? And don't lie either. Nothing. I have no plans, but I surely don't have no plans to come see you. <laughs> and so October of 2019, me and Dr. Forbes, we were blessed. We were in South Africa. And I didn't, we didn't plan it. We were up talking. We were going to go to breakfast, and we were just sharing. And that conversation where well, we actually was what, about one o'clock in the morning. And so our rooms were next to each other. And I said, oh, you know, we're talking. We talked till 7.30 in the morning to the point we was both exhausted. We still had to eat. <laughs> but when you begin to share, the timing in the earth is not the time of the spirit. Because it surely didn't feel like eight hours that we had talked seven, eight hours. And at that time during that conversation is when I told her what I had gone through in my, my the, the uh, adoption. And I begin to share with her. And what I love about your pastor is when, the, when God gives us gifts and you now own those gifts, and at any point in time, he can switch you from one thing to the other. And so we were talking as friends. Yeah, bro. Yes, yeah, sis. Da, 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 da. Then the spirit switches it. Then the pastor took over. She began to heal and provide words as a healing salve. Then the doctor took over. And she kept, and remember, I told her, I, she kept asking me, well, why? Well, why did you do that? How did you feel about that? And I was so, I said, stop asking me why. <laughs> now, the interesting thing about that is when I responded that way, Jared wouldn't talk to my sister that way. The spirit in me was upset. Why are you coming in here? Why are you asking me these questions? And when I tell you, you know you got a soldier. She sat right there and looked. Mm -hmm. I said, why? I said, uh-uh. You done switched now. I said, I'm going to wait and talk to this spirit mm -hmm. till Jared comes back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll talk to whoever want to talk. Who want to talk? Yeah. 
She sure I ain't did. got nowhere to go. I'm in Africa. <laughs> I ain't got no car. I'll talk to anybody. Jared the demon, I don't care. <laughs> Let's talk. Let's talk. Yes. <laughs> it's the whole truth. And so, so you go through the stages, the enemy, the spirit of the enemy, the devil. He has stages. He's a clown. He's an actor. And he's a master deceiver. So after I got upset, why are you asking me these questions? She sat there. I said, why? Well, why did you do that? Then I begin to cry. Takes you to that say, oh, because you want to get somebody to feel sorry for you. Oh, my God, I was crying. And I told her, I, was, I said, I mean, I mean, I was snotting and <laughs> hyperventilating crying. And she sat there and looked at me. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, at any point in time, my sister's going to hug me. She didn't even touch me. She sat there and let me go through all of those stages. When I got I say something? Sure. Tears touch. Be careful not to interrupt the touch of a tear. Which is why I hate a tissue demon. That's what I call it in church. When these altar workers and these services, God bless their heart, the Holy Spirit is shifting someone's entire life. And here you come with a Kleenex. You're on assignment by the underworld to interrupt the movement of the Spirit of God. He doesn't need us as much as we think he needs us. Obey God in every moment, not on a stage, but ministry is in a hotel room in Johannesburg. And if he doesn't tell you to move, don't move. Because can't nobody touch their child like God can yes. touch what kind of hug could I give to Jared in that? It would be inadequate. But God said, stand still. Watch me hug him. Mm -hmm. Oh, bless his name. Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, put your hands together. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And so we leave Johannesburg. I was so glad to get out of there. No, I wasn't. I'm just messing. It's just that moment was tough because I hadn't verbalized it at all. I hadn't verbalized how I was feeling or what I had experienced in the pain that I was feeling. And so I come back home and because that womb is now open, it's tender. You can't just act like it didn't happen. So now I'm saying, my Lord, what do I do with this? Because it's raw. I couldn't watch a movie about adoption. I couldn't watch a, uh, any series about foster children. The commercials would come up, and I would just literally, on my television, I would turn my head away. It was that painful for me. So put up picture number 12, if uh, you don't mind. And so here, I am being licensed in ministry. God bless my mother to come. And... She was called to pray for each one of the candidates that were being licensed in ministry this night. And after everything happened, and the service was beautiful, my sister, of course, was there. After the service was over, just because things are happening in your life does not mean that God is going to skip over what he started. So I go back home, and I said, Lord, it's still so, I have this hurt, I have this pain. What I love, among many things about Mother Stacks' ministry is that God had given her the unique ability to go into a person's life. She, had, she called it the academy. And she, would, she was able to go into a person's life and find out where they stopped growing. The light of God would unlock that door, shine into where you were so that you could see and then bring you out. And as close as I was to her, Knowing the ministry that God had given her, I've seen it down through the years, cities and states. I never tapped in for myself because, again, of my own issues and hurt and shame, being ashamed. So one night, you know, her, her ministry had grown and she was coming to Atlanta now. She came to, we were uh, having dinner, and I said, Mother, I, I have a question. I said, you know, until this point in my life, everything that I've pretty much asked God for, he's done. If I ask God, I want to drive this car, I want to live here, I want to do this type of job, he's done everything for me. I said, but this one thing, he's never responded to. And the question is, I've asked him, why will you not allow me to meet or find my biological parents? I had done many 
different courses of action. I knew state legislators personally. This, in, in the state of Pennsylvania, the, the law is there's only about three or four states in this whole in the whole country that when an adoption is completed, the records are sealed forever. And so the only thing that they will allow you to have is the medical history. But that's if the biological parents left that for you and you can get that at 18. So when I turned 18, I petitioned the state to obtain the medical records. And can you imagine the hurt that I felt when I received the letter from the state of Pennsylvania and said, there was nothing left for you. So I said, once again, the enemy said, I told you. They didn't even care enough to tell you if high blood pressure, sugar, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, if anything runs in your family. So at the, about the age 30 years old, I began getting physicals as if I was 45 because I didn't know what, I had to have early preventative exams. Please check and see if any prostate can, anything is developing. And when I would sit in my doctor's office, you know, you go into a new doctor and you, you you got a good job, and you seem to be rather astute, so you're sitting up, and the doctor says, well, what's your name? You know, Does this run in your family? I don't know. Does this run in your family? I don't know. He got to the third one. Does it? I said, I don't know. He looked at me, and I said, I'm adopted. I began to cry. I said, so I don't know. And he's the one, Dr. Barsanti. I don't know if he's still alive and well. If he is, God bless him right now. He loved on me. He said, no worries, man. He said, what we're going to do, he's the one who implemented. We'll have these exams early for you to find out so we can check and see what's going on. Because God will put people in your way to help you along the way. And so I say to mother, I said, you know, he's never answered that question. He said, I don't understand why. She said, because he doesn't want you to meet them. I said, well, mother, why don't he want me to meet him? She said, I don't know. I'm not God. I said, well, tell me, what do I do now? She said, you ask him to take them out of your heart. Take the pain out of your heart and the desire for them, take it out of your heart. Now, I believed the woman of God, I believed the word of God, so that night I went home, and in my prior time, got on my knees and I said, Lord, it wasn't no long, elaborate calling down fire from heaven. It was a sincere prayer from son to father. Lord, you know the pain that I'm dealing with. You know how I feel. I said, and if, if you said for me to take him out of the heart, I said, Father, right now, I'm asking you, heal my heart of this pain and take this desire away. The Bible says when Jesus would work miracles, it says, and some, as they went, they got their healing. Then he would tell some, go and wash in the pool. They got their healing. But then it talks about, and immediately. I'm here to tell you that night, when I prayed that prayer, Hallelujah. I had no more desire for my biological family. I was able to articulate how I felt and what I had gone through. The pain wasn't there. I wasn't welling up with tears when it happened because God had delivered me on the spot in my home. It wasn't a revival. He'll meet you wherever you are. How many know it to be the truth? Hallelujah. And so he said to me, he said, now that you have addressed this thing. He said, now I got to fix you up for the journey. Oh, bless his name. Go to picture 13 for me. And I'm going to hook you. I got you hooked up with a mother that has the ability to transmit power and spiritual gifts. And I'm about to load you up for this road ahead because you got to have something that's going to help you to stand in the end. And so the, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 1 and 6, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. And God used her to impart spiritual gifts. Every gift that we have, we know that come without repentance, right? According to the scripture. So we don't own anything. We don't take any glory for what God has done. You still got to go through the purification of your gifts, Called me a seer to God's leaders and to the body of Christ. So when I come into a church, I can see where the trajectory of this church is going. I can see if the pastors have gone off and or they still are on the line. This is why I come to check in. I love my brother and my sister. I want to make sure, how is the church growing? I want to see, is Kalana still holding on? Where's Kyron at? Where's Tim at? What they doing in God? I was upstairs and I was hearing the praises go up. I said, they got a different sound now. And that's indicative of your prayer life. Oh, bless his name. Hallelujah. He gave me exhortation and teaching and preaching and then prophecy. 
He said, I want you to use anyone at any time that I call you to use them. You're not an in-house prophet. You don't got your picks and chooses of who you want to bless and who you want to preach to. He said, if I tell you to go and find a homeless man or a homeless woman, you do what I said to do. Because you owe me your life. I saved you. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Like Paul said, he said, we're a bond servant. You're free, but you're still bound. Because you've got to serve the judge who gave you life. Oh, come on and praise him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And so now we have these gifts. And I said, well, what do we do with this at any point in time? You know, anything. You get a word dropped in your spirit. Oh, Lord, what do I do with this? But you got to be trained in your gifts. And so he took me and I'm working at my, I was working for AT&T and I was a trainer, corporate trainer. You're promoting up and through and I became a training manager. He said, the same way I made you a trainer in the natural with no education and no experience, the grace of God put you in senior leaderships in Fortune 500 companies, leading people that are far more credentialed than you. Doctors and master's degrees, and you are sitting up with your diploma. But the spirit of the living God knows all things. The Holy Ghost will give you strategy on how to move and how to operate. I'm going to show you how to start your company and be the CEO of that. And then I'm going to introduce you and hook you up with elite athletes and entertainers because it's a part of your ministry. You got to talk to them and tell them about a God because they're not coming to the churches. They've told me. The who's who's, wherever you can name, I know them. And they said, I don't go to church because when I decide I just want to come, I'm a soul. I just want a word. But they said, oh, we got so-and-so in the house. Give them a VIP parking. Put them up front. We're going to call them out. You got an offering for us. All we want to take pictures with them because these churches are clout chasing. I can talk on any level you want to talk on. So somebody got to go and find them and not to get anything from them, but to give something to them. During the seasons, they'll say, can you pray for me? Here I come with my oil. I sure enough can. What you have? Your ACL was out. He gave me a healing gift. You got to be used. And you got to do it with a pure heart. And so now, coming up on the end of everything, I said, Lord, I thank you for what you've done. I thank you for how you brought me. We think about how Jeremiah was. In that book of Jeremiah chapter 1, Jeremiah was the son of Hilkiah, the high priest. And Jeremiah had been riding on the works and the anointing and the grace of his father. But now God has moved Hilkiah out of the way. And he said, Jeremiah, now it's your turn. Come forth. And Jeremiah said, but I'm just a child. And I said, Lord, why did you say it so harshly to Jeremiah? Say not I'm a child. He said, because when, when you did the study, you found out Jeremiah was 19 years old. Jeremiah, you're not no child. But you've been real lazy, fair and lackadaisical. But it's time for you to come on out. Because King Josiah was sitting on the throne and he was 23. Yeah, yeah. So he's talking about you a child. Yeah. And the same for me. He said, I moved them out of the way because now it's time for you to come forth. It was no more, oh, I thank God. And you was riding with Bishop. He said, I let him go. Now it's me and you. And as I came up on the end, I said, Father, I'm grateful. And when my mother passed away in 2001, I said, Lord, the difference in 2001, in 2021, I'm excuse me, she passed away in 2021. When I went to her funeral, was I sad? Absolutely. You know, it was just natural love. But my faith wasn't shaken. My faith wasn't shaken because now I know him for myself. The God that she served is the God that I serve. Oh, bless his name. And I know that I've got work to do here in the earth. So I said, Lord, I thank you for everything you've done. If you go to picture number 15, one of the last times that we were together, she said, I got to give you something before I leave here. She said, I'm going to fill your belly up with power. Hallelujah. And so in this picture here, we were in Detroit. and She would put her hand in your belly. And I mean, you screaming bloody murder almost like, please get this woman off of me. But it was something that you had to have in order to take you to your next level. So I'm honored because God brought us this way to tell you all that in spite of what you've gone through, to tell the church in spite of what you're going through, in spite of what the enemy tells you, 
when he speaks in your spirits and in the midnight hour and tell you you're not good enough and nobody loves you. No, you don't know this person. You didn't have your daddy in your life. You didn't have your mother in your life. I don't care. God is a healer and he is a deliverer. And he said, you tell the people, Jeremiah 1 and 8, bring that up for me. He said, you tell the people, be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee. I am going to deliver thee, saith the Lord. He said, if I deliver you, I got to do it by my power. And the power of God is real. Luke 10, 19, he said, let them know it's not going to be just any old kind of power, but it's a special kind of power. Behold, I give unto you power. And this power is going to let you tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And the Bible says, and nothing, nothing shall by any means hurt you. So when God gives you instructions, walk boldly and do it because nothing's going to hurt you. Come on, clap your hands and thank God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Everybody's standing. Thank you, Lord. The reason why I can give this testimony and this word, if you will, to you is because if you look at society, society would say that you're a black man, you were put up for adoption, you were in foster care, ward of the state, you're not educated, so surely you should be a statistic. But I stand before you as a CEO of a company. I stand before you having traveled literally the world in ministry and in just secular, vacational, opportunities, licensed and ordained in ministry, leader in a Fortune 500 organization, not for any goodness of my own, but to let you know that regardless of what the enemy says, God's plan is sure. Oh, hallelujah. He always had a plan in mind, and it's always a plan to redeem us. He said, I come to rescue you. I come to rescue your life and I come to change your life around. A song it says, You have rescued my life. You have rescued my life. And I'll never go back. Whatever comes, my response is Hallelujah, you're my redeemer. Hallelujah, my response, my response is, let that get in your spirit, regardless of what may come, he's come to redeem us. Hallelujah. Why? Because you have rescued my life. You have rescued my life. The enemy had a plan. But God had another plan. So I'm never going back again to that hurt place. I'm never going back to that defeated place. I'm going to stand firm in the plan of God for my life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I'll never go back. Hallelujah. Everything I am, God made me. Everything I have, God gave me. Everything I know, the Lord taught me. Every place that I've been, God has brought me. He always gets the glory out of our lives. You have rescued my life. Woo! Yes, Lord. You have rescued my life. And I'll never, regardless of what may come, I'm not going back to that thing. My response is Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're my 
Bring us out, God. Hallelujah. Oh, you have rescued my life. want to open this altar if you want to come and pray for you. That God would heal our hearts. Yes, Lord. Listen, family, if there's anybody here in the building, we're not going to lay hands today at all, but if there's anybody in the building who has something, some type of pain that has happened over the course of your life, and it's been a little difficult for you to forgive, and that situation, that circumstance, that relationship, the disappointment has caused bitterness to come into your heart or resentment to come into your heart. We're not going to lay hands, but I just want Reverend Jared to pray for you because he has walked the supernatural healing of God instantaneously. And the Holy Spirit told me that if people came to this altar, that he would deal with it finally today. And so if that's you, it could just be one person. Just come to the altar really quickly. You don't have to worry. We're not going to lay hands. We don't need to. But God is going to heal yes. this situation today. Yes, today, today, today. Healing is yours today. Yes. Forgiveness is yours today. God is going to go into your heart into the corridors of your mind and he's going to take this trauma out he's going to take this torment out the thing that's hard for you to get a good night's rest when you see that person your stomach gets sick when you drive to that city you start to feel nauseous if you've been abused if you've been molested if you've been raped if you feel like you were left for dead if people have drag down your family yes. name if it is that you've been adopted if it is that you've been in foster care whatever the situation is god says i'm here to deal with it and i hear the spirit of the lord even saying i'm about to weep that there are those that are here that are even at the altar right now and you feel like you don't have what you need for your purpose you know that God has been speaking to you, but you feel like you don't have what you need. You don't have the education you need. You don't have the pedigree you need. You were not trained. I was not reared. But God says, if you let me heal you, not only am I going to heal you today, but I'm going to download everything that you need. It's going to be as if you have gone to school. It's yes. going to be as if you were certified. And so God says, not only am I going to heal the past, but I'm about to stack your mind for the future. And so, Minister Jared, hey, Reverend, I want you to pray for these people um, from the power of your spiritual lineage. And I want God to go into their past. Find them at the age that it happened. Yes, Lord. And pull them from that age and speed them up to developmental maturity on today. In Jesus' name. You have rescued. You have rescued my life. You have rescued my life. You have rescued my life. And I'm never. Hallelujah. Never going back. Never going back. You have rescued had a plan with you in mind. It's the plan of the Lord to redeem us. Yes, Lord. The plan of the Lord is stand sure. Hallelujah. To you. Hey, hey, hey. Hallelujah. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for this time of sharing. God, we thank you for the word that we heard today. God, we thank you for my life. I thank you for the tests and the trials. I thank you for your plan, oh God. I thank you for these people under the sound of my voice. They're your people, God. They're the apple of your eye. 
I thank you because you've or orchestrated or ordained every single thing that we've gone through. The good, the bad, and the indifferent. Father, I thank you for the pain that we feel. I thank you for what we've gone through because it's only making us greater. You're only going to use it for your glory. God, I ask now that you go into every single life. Right now, oh God, touch where it hurts, God. Touch where it's tender, oh God. Shine your light from heaven on our soul, Lord. Shine your light from heaven on our soul, God. Let us know that you are our Father. Let us know that you've had your hand on our lives since before we were born, before we were informed in the belly of our mother's womb. You had already knew us, oh God. You had this plan in place for us, oh God. And you designed us to be here today for our deliverance. God, we ask that you send that light in that dark place, God. The places that we've tucked away, the places that we've told nobody about. Oh God, we ask that you shine your light, oh God. Loose us from every chain, oh God. Loose us from every burden, oh God. Break the shackles in the name of Jesus. Bind the enemy right now, God. Oh God, bind his words. Bind his plan. Put a hedge of protection all around us, God. Break down every barrier that we put up. Loose our hearts, God. In the name of Jesus, set us free, O oh Lord, so that we can see your plan, so that we can hear your voice. Speak to us in the midnight hour. Oh, God, download your plan, O oh God, and then fill us up with your power to be able to do what it is that you've called us to do. In the mighty name of Jesus, this church is set as a light on a hill. It's not an accident that this is the nation's capital. Oh, God, let this church, let these people be a light to the world. In the name of Jesus, let this healed people, let this set free people, let this redeemed people be a light unto the world. In the name of Jesus, and we're going to thank you in advance. We're going to begin to clap our hands for what you're going to do. We're going to shout hallelujah because you're going to do it. We're going to shout thank you, Jesus, because we know that you're great. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. You have rescued. Thank you, Lord. All right, family, listen. Believe that he's done it by faith. Amen? It's according to your faith. You can go back to your seat. Be it unto you, healing of the Lord. Be it unto you, the freedom of the Lord. Be it unto you, the liberty of the Lord.